let's start looking at the picture that is on the monitor over there. That's uh, the result of a simulation run with a weather prediction model of clouds in the atmosphere. And it looks very much like what you would see with a satellite looking towards the Earth from space. The fact that these two pictures look so much alike is testament of the improvement in weather forecasting models that have become very accurate and useful for all of us when we want to plan our weekends. But what I want to talk about today is more about climate modeling, and climate models are a bit like weather forecasting models, except that we want to make predictions for decades to centuries, and so we must solve not just the evolution of the atmosphere, like in weather forecasting that is just for a few weeks, but we also have to solve for the evolution of vegetation on land, sea and land ice, um, ocean currents. So they are more complex systems. And what I want to address with you now, or want to discuss, is three questions. The first one being, are climate models today up to the task of making predictions that are useful for us to respond to climate change? The second question, if they are not, or there are questions they cannot address, can we do better? And the third one, is the information that these models make such that it is useful for all of us to make the decisions that we need to make about our future? So let's start from the first question. I want to see what is the skill of models today. So what I'm plotting here is the temperature increase as predicted by more than 100 um, climate models that have been submitted for evaluation by the TUDE, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for their six assessment report. And so you see a shaded area. That's all these climate models, all their prediction moving towards the future. On the vertical axis, what you see is the temperature increase. The axis starts by one degree Celsius, or if you want, one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, because that's how much the temperature has already increased since the beginning of last century. But we're looking how we move towards the future. What you see is that all models agree on one point, that whether the climate is getting warmer or the mean temperature of the Earth is rising, and that's in response to uh, emission of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So indeed, one of the useful information that comes out of these models that this we've known for a while is that, yes, we should reduce emissions if we want to mitigate the changes in future climate. But if you look in details, the models then make different projections about how much the temperature will really increase. Some of the models you see on the lower end predict that by 2060, the temperature will increase by something like 1.5 degrees. That's a climate where tropical cyclone will become more intense. Sea level rise, for example, will increase by 20 to 30 centimeters. Those are big changes, and they will require substantial investment to address them. But overall, as a society, it's something we can cope with. But you see, some other models are predicting that in 40 years, the temperature might be 3.5 degrees higher than today. That's a very different situation. It's a climate where coral reefs will be destroyed, where sea level will rise to the point that we reshape our coast and uh, cities where most people live along the coast. It's a climate where more than half of crops will constantly be subject to substantial drought. So that kind of climate would disrupt our economy infrastructure to a point that it's going to be much more difficult to adapt to. So when it comes to adaptation in particular, that difference in projections is such that it's a bit difficult to decide which way you want to move or how you want to adapt. And why are these models making such different predictions? Well, it turns out, for example, that one of the uh, big differences in these models is the one that predicts a smaller temperature change are associated also with a climate that generally has more cloud coverage, while the ones that predict a higher temperature change are the ones that are associated with less cloud coverage. So there are details in these models that seem to make a big difference in their projection. And so what I want to move on now is to explain why can we do better than we are doing today to make this model more useful, and useful in particular for all of us to make decisions. And I think to explain why I think we can do better, it's useful to make an analogy with how we approach medical care. So assume that you are this person on the left, and so you realize you've been sick for a while, so it's something more than just a regular flu. And in terms of the analogy, we've experienced a pretty warm fall this last couple of months. But you know that it's not just an accident of this year. You've seen the weather pattern have changed for a while, so it's really something is changing. So if it happened to you in your um, medical assessment, then the next thing you do is probably you want to go to a doctor and ask to collect data, meaning do blood tests, imaging, or whatever it is. Indeed, that's something we do for the climate system. We have satellites that continually monitor various aspects of the atmosphere, the moisture, um, 
greenhouse gases concentration. We do have ground stations to sample vegetation. We have uh, uh, floats and ships that monitor the ocean. So that's something where I put the thumbs up. It's something we are already doing. But the next step in your medical care is that you'd like to have a doctor then that uses all that information to come up with a diagnosis of what is your ailment and make a prognosis of what might be in front of you. Well, there I put a thumb down in the way we are approaching climate today in terms of modeling, because our models use only a very small subset of the data that we are collecting, and different models on top of it use different subsets of data, and you see, as a result, they end up making very different predictions. It's like very different prognosis of what is happening to the climate. So that's the first thing that we have to address. The second one is that then you want your doctor, once they come out with a reasonable diagnosis and prognosis, to recommend a cure in terms that you understand. You don't want your doctor to give 100 pages of the whole relevant literature on your disease in a jargon you cannot really understand. Well, again, I would put a thumb down for the moment where we at in climate modeling because climate models are difficult to run. I mean, you need the experts to run them, and they are very expensive computational. You need a computing center if you want to run it. You cannot run it on your phone. So that information is not easily accessible. So I want to touch on both of these points in the next couple of slides. For the first one, can we improve on climate models? This is work that a group of us at Caltech and MIT has decided to tackle in, what, in a project that we call the Climate Modeling Alliance, or CLIMA for short. CLIMA is also uh, latent for climate, so it gives you more credibility, I guess. The goal here is that we want to use all available data, meaning all satellite data, ship-based information, flow data, ground station data, to train models to better represent, for example, as the uh, point I made before, cloud coverage in the atmosphere. That's something that you would assume we would have done before, but the problem is that you have a massive amount of data and very complex models, and until recently it wasn't that easy to figure out how you use all that data to inform a model. But with advances in machine learning, which is essentially is an exercise like that, you've trained, you've, uh, Google has trained your phone to recognize your face by using a massive amount of face information around the world, and so you're playing a bit of the same exercise here. So machine learning is something that will allow us to do this exercise. And on top of that is advances in computational architecture, like graphical processing units that allow us to run models much faster, much faster than we could in the past. In addition, we ha are using new computing languages like Julia developed here at MIT, and all of this allows us to do fully this exercise, and then we are in a position in the panel on the right, where we have a new model, we call it the Klima model, that in this particular snapshot I just showed you, total precipitable water and the temperature in the atmosphere from this model, that's not particularly important. But now we have a model that, if you tell me a particular emission scenario in the next 40 years that you want to study, can give you more accurate information about, for example, what is the probability of extreme droughts or uh, extreme precipitation events or sea level, sea level rise in a particular part of the world. So now we have this information that is essential to make decisions about how to act into especially adaptation of climate change or also in mitigation. And pretty much all you've heard so far in most of the talks is people that make proposals about what we could do. Now you have information to test whether those ideas are actually viable and useful. But are we done? And I will contend, not quite, because the problem is that we are in a situation where we have a model like the Klima model that we are designing on one end, and then we have all of us on the other hand, but there is a big gap in between, meaning that it's hard for us to access that information. In the weather forecasting analogy, it would be like asking you to run a full weather forecasting model every time you want to decide whether to go on a hike. Well, first of all, you don't have the computing resource, and if you did, it would probably take you days to do, run all that model, and then by that, the hike is past and gone. What have we done in the weather forecasting world? Well, what happens is that you have apps on your smartphones where you can download the information that is relevant to you to know, indeed, whether you want to go on a hike tomorrow. When it comes to climate modeling, the problem is a bit more complicated because it's not just that you don't want to just be a passive receiver of information. For example, you want to know if you decide to transform transportation into electric transportation, what would be the impact on emission and the impact on climate? So you want something we call an emulator more than an app, where you can give some input and you want to get the output. What is your idea and what would be the impact so you can access it? 
So you need to fill that gap in the middle. And this is why I'm here. I hope that I think that the artificial intelligence community at large or machine learning community at large can really help us to fill that gap. Indeed, for one example of many, NVIDIA has recently announced that they designed a new weather forecasting model that is not an app in the sense it doesn't just download data, they just use machine learning to learn for the, from the complex weather forecasting model how to make a prediction on a much faster time scale than running the full model. They can make now weather forecasts in a matter of seconds instead of hours. Using the same technique but applied to the climate system, you could use a more accurate climate model to have an emulator that fast allows you to assess different decisions. For example, you have a brilliant idea, and we heard some of them today, on how, I don't know, dissolve carbon in the ocean more effectively. What would be the impact on climate future or the future of climate in the next 40 years? So to conclude, I just want to say that I think I have, I mean, we all see that, or at least I tend to see in the way I read the news, that the largest majority of humanity, in particular new generation, really care about the future of the planet, and they'd like to help. But in order to be effective in helping us moving forward and addressing these changes, we need to provide people with the relevant information to make the best decisions. And so by both dividing, designing climate models that are better informed by data on one hand, and then making that information available so that they can actually poke and get information about their different solutions like everybody that is talking today, I think that we can really hope to make progress in addressing climate change and being more effective in reducing its impact on society. Thank you.